So David, share, share your concerns after finding benzene in so many products that Leslie had tested at your lab. It is really concerning exposure to benzene, consistent exposure, down to one part per million being linked with increased risk of leukemia. Uh, it's cancer of the blood tissue. And uh, you know, regulatory agencies all around the world have been very concerned about this. Uh, benzene is a group one carcinogen. It means known to cause cancer in humans. We're not just talking about animal data. We're not just talking about a product. You know, I think a lot of consumers get confused. They get told so many times about sulfates or parabens or phthalates. And, and not to say that these aren't concerning, but there's just beginning to be data on those products. Benzene has been studied for over 100 years, and it was shocking to us, too, to see all of this in consumer products. And to the point about where the benzene and is coming from in our detection, major companies have done recalls based on our work. Uh, the FDA itself has even tested some hand sanitizer and said they found benzene. Johnson & Johnson did a recall of Neutrogena and Aveeno uh, uh, sunscreens, and now FDA documents are showing that actually the amount of benzene that Johnson & Johnson found was even higher than, than in the, what, we, what, we, what we were finding in our reports. So, and, and lastly, the FDA has even come out with documents just to underscore everything that you guys have said, that they evaluated the contamination in, in sunscreen and determined that the degree of health hazard associated with the use of a defective product that's contaminated with benzene is life-threatening, as in death has or could occur. We're not talking about products that are a little bit over the limit. David, give us that number again. What were those levels you saw? How many more times? Did you say 500 plus? Just in the products that Les was sending us. We've seen in our reports even higher than that in a variety of products. And if you look at, at other guidance, like the, from NIOSH, the, the, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, they set a, a limit of 0 0.1 parts per million for workers that think they're going to be exposed to, to benzene should put on protective equipment at 0 0.1. And we're looking at 10. That's 100 times higher. Wow. And obviously if you're using protective equipment, that dry wow. shampoo is not going to be very effective. And, and David, do we, do we still have no idea how benzene is getting into these products? Is it a, a breakdown product of something else that's in there? Or what, what is your theory? We don't know for sure. Obviously, Valisher doesn't make it, any of these products. But uh, what we have heard, and Procter & Gamble uh, was the first one to do recalls on, on antiperspirant products and also proactively went forward and investigated and did recalls on dry shampoos. They said in, in their own press releases, which is great to hear direct from industry, that they found unexpected levels of benzene came from the propellant that sprays the product out of the can. And to your point earlier, if it coming from the petroleum industry, you know, benzene is known to contaminate uh, a whole variety of products like butane, propane, gasoline. Um, and it's actually some of these propellants like butane and propane that are actually what make aerosol sprays spray. But David, I find it interesting that a lot of the products I tested, more than half, didn't have any benzene at all. So it is possible to manufacture these products and not have benzene in them. That's absolutely correct. And it's an extremely important point. You know, most of the products that we've tested at Valisher, even in our studies and reports, don't have any benzene that we're able to detect. So it can be made cleanly and you know, to the point that everybody assumes that the FDA is out there testing everything. I mean, that's just not true that the actual manufacturing process and the regulatory framework called GMP, good manufacturing practice, uh, puts it all up to the manufacturers. The manufacturers are supposed to do the testing. They're supposed to come up with what the testing methods are and then uh, self-report that to the FDA. So it's really an honor system that works most of the time, but definitely not all the time. And, you know, I think there's a really big missing component of independent testing uh, independent validation. You know, you don't buy anything on Amazon without looking at reviews. You wouldn't even buy a used car without looking at a hundred point inspection or a Carfax report. And yet there's none of this independent review of pharmaceutical products or even certainly cosmetic products. So we, we hope to see a lot more of that in the future.